good evening. This is your host, Dr. Brandy Gibson, and I'm here again on Mondays for Marketplace Monday on the Women in Ministry TV broadcast. We're glad that you're back with us and that you have enough competence in this ministry to continue to gain and glean from us, obtaining insights and practical applications towards building the kingdom of God. Amen building the kingdom of God and in marketplace ministry. Well, today I'm going to start, uh, going to take a little twist, a little different uh, manner in which I'm going to bring this to you. I have to bring it in the manner in which God gave to me to give to you. So we're going to talk about contentment today. But before we get into that subject matter, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for sending Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to be within us and upon us for service. Father, we thank you that this is a time that we glorify you. You give us all of the revealed knowledge required to meet the needs of people. And in the interim, you bless us as well financially all to your glory. So, Father, we thank you for this word today, that it is clear, accurate, and that the people receive and act upon what is given. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise God. I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to get right into that momentarily, but I just want to give a brief intro in reference to some things that I think are definitely necessary. Um, Today, we've experienced um, in this last year, oh my gosh, a horrendous phenomenon called a pandemic that was really beyond our natural control. We've experienced lack due to it. We've experienced experienced lack in communication, you know, lack of travel, lack of money, lack of family ties for, you know, people that, and friends that actually live in different states where you just, their travel was cut off. You couldn't get to them, you know, and thank God we still had cell phones um, where we could still have the opportunity to communicate from that standpoint, but there was a lack that went throughout the globe, not just the land, the globe. It was a global pandemic, and because of it, it affected the marketplace severely. It hit the marketplace where it cut down on productivity, um, cut down on employment, shut the doors on businesses, and the ultimate goal to shut the mouth of the church. So we have to understand that some things, you know, we look at and we hear from a media standpoint and we think, okay, whatever they say is fine. Just like when a lot of people go to the doctor for a diagnosis, the doctor will tell you, A, B, C, and I'm going to give you this prescription. You take this three times a day. They take it. They grab it. They believe it. They don't question it. They don't even look at what the side effects are. They just take it for granted. And this is something that is historically a habit. And culturally, the enemy knows it, and he wants to apply it to various cultures. He wants us to get very, very content in receiving the things that are being sent. Now, you know, contentment can be a positive and a negative. So I want us to focus on some things because this past year, beginning in, you know, 2020, it was nothing more than a diabolical year. And uh, because of that, as entrepreneurs, none of us were really equipped to say, okay, I have a contingency plan to, you know, deal with this sort of thing. No, we were caught, you know, unprepared. But now, through seeking the face of God, he has shown us what to do. But see, even in seeking the face of God, 
Some may have started out in faith. Some may have started out in fear, and fear actually drew people to seeking the face of God. But let's talk about that a little more. You know, right now what's ahead is that we need to be in preparation for the rapture of the church because what we experienced last year, even though horrific and things are, you know, racism, division, all things that you're seeing, I mean, just crazy issues popping up left and right with no resolutions and no solutions. Entrepreneurs, especially those called by God, are here to correct wrongs and meet needs. Wherever there's a need, God has a person set up to handle that need from an entrepreneurial standpoint. So the economic development within the globe is necessary for the body of Christ to obtain in the marketplace and sustain it. Amen? So what's apparent? What is apparent? is that the shaking of the nations and the falling away of many so-called believers has actually begun. Initially, you know, fear of the pandemic caused a number of people to cry out to God, as I was saying previously, and to seek him. But as things began to look as if they were clearing up just a bit, you know, like in the month of May, then it felt as if, okay, the veil is lifting. And then the majority of mankind became so confident in the vaccine faith that the numbers and so forth uh, of real, realistically have not been accurate. But I'm not here to talk about that. What I'm here to say is we have to operate in wisdom. And too many people have become very content in their environment, and that environment is not seeking God. They're not seeking God for employment. They're not seeking God um, to develop businesses. They're not seeking God for their purpose. They have been totally content on waiting on a government response a government stimulus check. And so they set themselves up for contentment to become resentment. And after that, disbelief in the true source of truth and provision. So a very organized and subtle move of the enemy is what we're seeing take place. And many people are blinded by it. But I'm talking to you, a person of faith, an entrepreneur currently, or either an entrepreneur that God is calling. You haven't started your business yet, but God is calling you into the marketplace. I want to focus on what God gave me for you today, and that's contentment. He doesn't want you content in the environment he doesn't want you content with the naysayers report. He wants you content in his word. So that's why I want you to take a look at 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's look at verse 1. We're going to look at verse 1. So verse 1, it reads, <clears throat> And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab. Now, Ahab is the king at that particular time. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Elisha stressed the fact that this would be according to his word. Now, I want you to listen to the NEB translation. 
He says, I swear by the life of the Lord, the God of Israel, whose servant I am, that there shall neither, there shall be neither dew nor rain these coming years unless I give the word. So obviously this man of God, this prophet of God had faith in knowing that whatsoever he decreed was going to come to pass. He knew his authority. You can only know your authority when you know who's giving you the authority. That's what an ambassador does. An ambassador operates out of the authority of the king that has sent them. Now, verse two says, and the word of the Lord came unto him saying, now the Lord speaks to Elijah here with directions and assignments. And he says, get the hence and turn the eastward and hide thyself by the brook Sherif that is before Jordan. Now the word Sherif means a cutting. And God is telling him to get by the brook, by a ravine where he's going to supernaturally feed the man of God, okay? So he's giving him instructions and those instructions are to hide himself. Why is he hiding? Because when we go back to verse one, we clearly see that he told Ahab, the king, who's married to Jezebel, who wants to have total control of everything, including her husband, Ahab, because that's what a Jezebel is. Jezebel doesn't have to deal and does not deal with how you dress, the wear of makeup, uh, the style of your hair, the color of your lipstick. As you notice, I have on red lipstick, red nails. I am not your Jezebel. A Jezebel wants to always have control over the situations and especially over men. Okay, so let's let's move on. God told him to hide himself because Ahab, with his chicken heart itself, was going to go to Jezebel and tell Jezebel what Ahab had done. He had decreed literally that there was going to be a drought in the land and it's going to stop raining. No dew is going to come up. No rain is going to fall down. And this is going to be in existence until he says for it to stop. Now, that's a man of serious faith. Now, one of the things I want you to know is that you can be in a dry place. You can be in the wilderness because that's what a drought is. You can be in the wilderness from not hearing from God. That's when you got to zero in. And as an entrepreneur, you're not exempt from not hearing from God. Too many times we want to divide our roles as a believer, you know, on Sunday, Wednesday, and then Monday through Friday, we're the entrepreneur. And then Saturday, hey, I'm just saying, we're the partier. So you have to understand that you cannot divide yourself as far as being a believer and an entrepreneur. You're one. You're a believer who operates as an entrepreneur and manifests the blessing of God on the earth. Amen. So what's happening is God wanted Elijah to literally trust in him and trusting in him rather than his provision. Because he's already told him, you get by the brook, I'm going to provide provision for you. And what he did is he provided it by scavenger birds. Now, I made some notes here, and I want to just read this to you, because uh, this is going to be a series, by the way, so there's no way I'm going to finish this today. So, I want to give you some characteristics of a raven because remember he says in verse five, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord for he went and dwelt by the brook Sharif that is before Jordan. And verse six says, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening 
and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been what? No rain. It's a drought. He decreed it himself. So you're by the brook, you got water, and the ravens are bringing you food, but he still has to trust in the God of his provision. Too many people today are looking at their environment and they're panicking still because they don't know how they're going to survive. Unfortunately, we even have a lot of people that have had mental disorders based on what they encountered last year. A number of people have even committed suicide. Suicide rates have just escalated even in the numbers with our children and our youth. And it's time for the church to arise. But we must know that for the believer, God has us in what is called a spiritual Goshen. Nothing can befall you. Nothing. Nothing. When you read about Joseph bringing his family into Egypt, because he had so much favor and he was highly skilled in what he did, he was sought out after for his expertise and God promoted him. And then he was able to bring his family in. And what happened? There was a wealth transfer that was given. What was the wealth? Land, real estate. They stayed in that land. They came in at 70 people. They went out of the land in droves of millions. So let's get back to the ravens because here it is. God is feeding the raven, uh, feeding Elijah by the scavengers, the ravens. So let me give you these characteristics because I know a lot of you may be interested in this. Number one, the raven has uh, for a long time, been associated with death and dark omens. But the real bird is much more multifaceted. So I'm going to tell you 10 characteristics today. See, the ravens are extremely smart. And this is probably why God used them. When you look at, uh, in comparison um, to the intelligence of a dolphin, you have to rank a raven right next to it. So these birds rate right up there with chimpanzees and with the dolphins. Now in the wild, ravens have pushed rocks on people. Listen to me. They push rocks on people to keep them from climbing up to their nest. And they've also played dead. I'm telling you this, Mark. They play dead beside a beaver carcass or whatever carcass to scare the other ravens away so that they won't get their meal. Getting that something? Okay, here's number two point. In captivity, ravens can learn to talk better than some parents. Parrots, 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 and parents too. Well, whatever. They also mimic after noises. They can mimic a car engine, a toilet flushing, animal and bird calls. Ravens have been known to imitate wolves or foxes to attract them to carcasses that they just can't break open because they're so large. So when these large animals come in and they start consuming the large carcass, as soon as they leave, then the ravens go in and they get their fill. Smart. Now, the third point is European cultures actually have viewed ravens as dark and evil, as I stated before. So we're going to look like um, in various nations such as in France, for instance, people believe that ravens were the souls of wicked priests, <laughs> while crows were the wicked nuns. Then in Germany, ravens were the incarnation of the damned souls, or sometimes Satan himself. 
in Sweden, ravens that croaked at night were thought to be the souls of murdered people who didn't have proper Christian burials. I tell you, man, can come up with some crap all up. Okay, let's go to the next one. In Denmark, people believe that night ravens were exercise spirits. And you better not look at them in case there was a hole in the bird's wing. Because you might look through the hole and turn into a raven yourself. I know this is getting deep. This is like some Sherlock Holmes stuff, ain't it? All right. Well, ravens also appear in many other uh, mythologies. And so uh, cultures from Tibet to Greece have seen the raven as a messenger of the gods. And then there's the Celtic goddesses of warfare often took the form of ravens during their battles. Uh, the Viking god Odin, O-D-I-N, had two ravens named Huggin, meant thought, and Munin, meant memory, which flew around the world every day and reported back to Odin every night about what they saw. Chinese myths said ravens caused bad weather in the forest to warn people that the gods were going to pass by. And many Native American peoples considered the raven a sly trickster who was involved in the creation of the world. Why would a sly trickster be involved in the creation of the world? Okay, here's the fifth point. Ravens love to play. Ravens have been observed in Alaska and Canada using snow-covered roofs as slides. <laughs> in Maine, they have been seen rolling down snowy hills, and they often play keep away with other animals like, like wolves, otters, and dogs. Ravens even make toys. I'm telling you, these animals are intellectual. These birds are intellectual. A rare animal behavior by using sticks. They'll have pine cones. They'll use golf balls or rocks to play with each other or play by themselves. Especially, you know, if like some humans, they're the only child, they'll find something to play by themselves. <clears throat> now leave that alone. And sometimes they just taunt or mock other creatures because it's funny. Now, let's look at the six characteristics. They do weird things with ants. They lie in ant hills and roll around so the ants swarm on them. Or they chew or the ants up and rub their guts on their feathers. <laughs> the scientific name for this is anting. Some songbirds, crows, and jays do it also. Now, the behavior is not well understood. Theories about this purpose range from the ants acting as an insecticide and a fungicide for the bird and to ant secretions soothing a mocking bird's skin to the whole performance being a mild addiction. Hmm. One thing seems clear though, anting feels great if you're a bird. If you're a bird, don't you go out there getting rolling around in an ant hill. Okay, seventh point, ravens use hand gestures. It turns out that ravens make sophisticated non-vocal signals. According to researchers, in other words, they gesture to communicate. A study in Austria found that ravens point with their beaks to indicate an object to another bird, just as we do with our fingers. They also hold up an object to get another bird's attention. This is the first time researchers have observed naturally occurring gestures in any animal other than primates. 
The eighth characteristic of, a, uh, characteristic of a raven is that they're adaptable to different environments. They can live in a variety of habitats, from snow to desert to mountains to forest. They are scavengers with a varied diet that includes fish, meat, seeds, fruit, carrion, and garbage. They are not above tricking animals out of their food, and one raven will distract the other animal. For example, the uh, other will steal its food. They have few predators, and they live a long time, 17 years in the wild and up to 40 years in captivity. Ravens also roam around in teenage gangs. This is interesting. I know it is. Uh, ravens mate for life and live in pairs in a fixed territory. That's just, oh Lord, a lot of you out there need to take a lesson from the raven. Now, when young ravens reach adolescence, they leave home and join gangs like every human mother's worst nightmare becomes. These flocks of young birds live and eat together until they mate and pair off. Interestingly, Living among teenagers seems to be stressful for the raven. Scientists have found higher levels of stress hormones in teenage raven droppings than in the droppings of mated adults. It's never easy being a teenage rebel. And the last point is ravens show empathy for each other. Now, despite their mischievous nature, ravens seem capable of feeling empathy. When a raven's friend loses in a fight, they will seem to console the losing bird. They also remember birds they like and will respond in a friendly way to certain birds for at least three years after seeing them. But they also hold grudges. Although a flock of ravens is called in unkindness, the birds appear to be anything but. Now, this information I found by the author, Joy Lazendorfer, and I thought this was really, really good information. But when we look back at the word of God and we see in verse six that the ravens brought Elijah bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook and he stayed there till he dried up. What's so interesting is I already told you what ravens do. They eat flesh, meat. Uh, fruits, vegetables, garbage, all of that. So God had it designed that they would probably go to the king's banquet, pull up a chicken or a turkey and fly it right in, bring it right to Elijah without eating it themselves. I tell you, this is obviously a miracle. And miracles are what people are looking for today. Actually, people that are searching for miracles and looking for signs are people of the world because they want to see rather than believe. And God has called us in this hour to do greater works. Greater works shall we do. We see that in John 14, verse 12. So I'm going to get into part two next week to provide you with some more outlooks on Elijah and what transpired and what it is aligned with in our environment today. So I encourage you, if you would, to take time to get before God. Consider Women in Ministry TV. Sow a donation into that ministry so that it can expand its horizons and fulfill the objective that God has given it to do. Also, I want to encourage you to be a blessing to this ministry as well. You will see the information on the exit as we close the show. And I really pray that you seek God's face about what to give and whatever he says is what you do. You will be blessed in doing so. This has been an awesome, awesome time with you. 
I encourage you also to go to my website. You'll see the information regarding Seven Figures Digital Magazine for Women and the Uncommon Man. I encourage you to take the subscription. It's a dynamic magazine for the marketplace today. So, and then there are some of you that we need to write about too. So until next week, this is your host, Dr. Brandy Gibson, saying it's been a pleasure hearing from you and speaking to you today.